Welcome. Thank you for coming back and uh, revisiting the White Cloaks YouTube channel. Uh, I'm Pips, doing another sort of uh, deep dive conversation. And I have with us everyone's favorite uh, drunken White Cloak, Dane Bordhald, also our oh. resident lore expert. Uh, oh, goodness. <laughs> yep, there you go. That That is now resting firmly on your shoulders. Uh, you can't give it back. <laughs> So we're here to talk about I, the prologue. At least I can drink. That is, yes, that is true. We're here to talk about the prologue. Um, it's it's been a conversation a little bit in the uh, the making. In fact, we actually recorded this uh, a few weeks ago, and had some technical difficulties with with some sound levels and stuff like that. So we're trying to we're trying to revisit this again. Uh, my apologies. All the technical things are my faults. Dane Dane was great last time. I think he'll be just as good this time. Um, so let's, let's just dive right into it. Um, Dane. The prologue. Yeah. The prologue. The I mean, you've prologue. said before, one of the best ones. So, so tell me a little bit about why you love the prologue and then we'll go in. It, it throws you off the deep end, like nothing I've ever read. Um, and the, it really opened my eyes on the rereads of it. Um, once you read through the series, wherever it was done, incomplete um, for most of us who who have been longtime fans of the series. Um, but once you feel like you've gotten through everything, and okay, now I want to see spoilers. Um, it was web discussions that were basically pointing you back to the original prologue, the very first two and a half pages that you read, telling you, okay, you missed this, you missed that. A hint uh, was left here. Uh, this might be a clue for an, an ongoing mystery, etc. Um, and I was completely blown away by finding things and then continuing to find things when further books came out. So so where where were you, um, I guess, you know, set, this, set the scene for us, right? When you first read mm -hmm. the prologue, I mean, time, time frame, what are, we, what are we looking at? How long has this been a, a sort of traveling companion with? So I, I picked up the Eye of the World because I was heading to Europe on a family vacation when I was 16. So I read the prologue in an airplane seat and had to put it down afterwards because I didn't get it. I was like, what the heck did I just read? Um, I'm sorry, my screen's going blank. <laughs> it's all right. It's all good on my end. All right. Um, not on mine, unfortunately. I have my notes up, so sorry. Okay, I'm back. Um so yeah, I was reading it. I didn't know what to make of it. It was relatively short and none of it made any amount of sense because I thought this was supposed to be a fantasy story. And there were just elements of it that seemed a little bit too, too sci-fi or that um, nothing was explained. Like it was, like it really honestly felt like I was just thrown off, um, thrown off a 10 meter uh, diving board into the deep end of the pool. And I needed to take a break from it. Now, I ended up reading all of The Eye of the World on that summer vacation. Uh, and I think I read the book twice um, before getting to The Great Hunt. So, so it didn't make a whole lot more sense on the second read either, I don't think. So you bring up one of the things that I actually really like about this prologue is that uh, Robert Jordan really respects his reader. Uh, respects their intelligence, their ability to kind of keep up. Because, yeah, he, uh, he throws you right in sort of, uh, you know, post events happening with little explanation. And it takes really, I mean, the rest of the rest of the entire series to make sense of all of it. Um, but uh, before before I think we get too far into all of the things that make sense at what times, uh, let's just cover. I know everyone who's probably watching White Cloaks. On, <laughs> if you're here, you've read the books, I will say. Full spoilers, we are obviously going to talk a lot about uh, what happens in the prologue and extend that conversation throughout the entire series. So now that the spoilers warning is out of the way, Dane, let's, let's go through what actually happens in the prologue. Yeah, main story beats. So what do you get in the first couple paragraphs? You get a kind of post-apocalyptic setting, right? It's a, a palace, it's shaking, uh, there's earthquakes going on. There's fire and soot and ruin, and you have a guy walking the palace halls who's looking for someone. All right, remember that name. Is he important? I don't know. At the end of the prologue, he kind of explodes. But 
by the third or fourth paragraph, you've got Lewis Theron kind of acting a little bit nuts. And then somebody teleports in. And, and this is what I'm saying about it felt kind of science fiction-y. Um, because the first place that your mind goes to when someone's teleporting is Star Trek. And you don't actually see characters do this for many, many books. Yeah. Um, that said, there's good description of his costume with the, the lace at his throat and the high top boots. They've all got weird kind of fantasy sounding titles like Lord of the Morning and Betrayer of Hope. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a quick little bit of world building about Satan or Shaitan. Um, that gets filled in pretty quickly later when, when Matt's talking about uh, naming the Dark One and whatnot. So it's a little nugget for you to discover kind of almost immediately. You mm -hmm. get some dialogue without any context whatsoever. So in terms of main story beats, you have an antagonist and a protagonist seemingly going at it. Um, and there is, without any context for anything that they're saying, you really only get kind of the issue that this is a, a titanic struggle. One of them's nuts uh, and not really engaging in the conversation. And then Lewis Theron gets healed magically somehow. Which leads you then in the next page to probably the, the bigger piece of world building, um, which is where uh, the Betrayer of Hope talks about how they've fought this battle, um, a thousand battles with every turning of the wheel, a thousand times a thousand, and we'll fight until the end of time, until the shadow, time dies and the shadow is triumphant. Now it's finally cluing in, oh, this is what the wheel of time means, right? Mm -hmm. This is a fantasy world where time is cyclical. So this is a paragraph that you definitely pick up on on your first read as something being important. And it is somewhat central to setting up the stakes uh, and the main parties in the conflict of the story. That said, you don't really get a whole much uh, whole much from this. You you get Lewis Theron gets a new name bequeathed to him, Kinslayer. Um, you get to see what the effect of the madness was. So you definitely get... Um, uh, some stakes build up, and that it is actually a, a horrible, terrible thing. And then some other weird magic usage around uh, teleporting, and then a volcano erupts. And that's pretty much where you're left off. Uh, on and, your first read, not and, knowing how it's fantasy. How, how is it going to look like the cover? of you know guys with swords on horseback riding out of a quick yeah. mountain village and honestly you said you know and, and that's that's what you get and and about that quickly i think you said before it's about 2500 words uh for those reading so i'm looking at you know a hardcover kind of a depiction of this it's only like five pages so yeah uh, which is which is actually kind of remarkable when you think of robert jordan's uh tendency <laughs> in prologue writing uh it's the most restrained. Um, it's the most restrained and and also dense prologue that he gives us. Um, I do want to say there's one other thing that I would still consider to be part of the prologue that I actually think is really key, and that's the the two sort of um, like historian kind of kind of notes that are given there before you you know turn the page and you see the map of the world right. And it's the uh, the breaking of the world, author unknown, the fourth age, and then you get the cycle of the dragon or an excerpt from the cycle of the dragon again, author unknown, the fourth age, and these and these are sort of, you know, the the kind of classic lines. I think they were used in the Winter Dragon. I think uh, excerpts might have been used in the uh, the Wheel of Prime. <laughs> um, but I think that those are also kind of part of everything you get. So like you said, you get this this whole thing that is just a punch in the face of, you know, events. Um, and you've brought this up before about the, the narrative as well, being a different narrative point of view than you get for the rest of the books, really. And then more sort of yeah, you know, so, third-party narrative so, of the, the historian notes. So, so the, uh, the, you're right. The, the prologue is one of the few... And when I say the prologue, I mean the, the initial prologue of The Eye of the World. It's one of the few things that's not told from that uh, third person limited. Yeah. Right? It's not, it's not from anyone's point of view. It's from kind of an omniscient point of view. 
Um, and you, you raise a good point about these two historical excerpts. I, I've got the uh, 30th anniversary edition, unfortunately. So since I flipped ahead past, you know, 50 pages of the Ravens stuff, I completely forgot that there was actually um, <laughs> th those two up front because, uh, they're, yeah, they're separated by quite a few pages in, in the, uh, my edition. But yeah, you're 100% you're right about that. Okay, so, I mean, that's, that's what happened. Every, again, everyone who's watching this already knows this. So let's talk, um, you know, what, what are your takeaways from all of this as that first-time reader? Okay, so very good point, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the two historical clips up front um, because yeah. there are certain references that you get, right? So a breaking of the world, uh, you also get uh, Prince of the Morning, yep. and the first thing that, uh, uh, that the Betrayer of Hope tells Lewis Theron is that he's the, the Lord of the Morning, so you kind of get that. And it, it seemed, all right, this is a scary freaking guy who went nuts and blew everything up but he also seems to be a salvation figure so that much is at least kind of set up in the back of your mind but what do you pick up as a first-time reader from this you got this guy named lewis theron telemon who's been renamed lewis theron kinslayer who killed everyone that he ever loved and he went insane and he created a mountain that much I, I kind of got out of the gate. And it's reinforced when um, Rand and Matt are discussing a couple chapters later about who the Dark Rider could be. And they initially think maybe it's the Dark One. And then in close second, or it could be a Forsaken or whatnot, um, but in close second behind being scary is maybe it was the Dragon. So the Salvation figure is almost equally feared as the big bad in the series. Um, another thing that you pick up is naming the Dark One and that it's dangerous. So this is on the second page of the prologue. Yeah. Where um, where the Betrayer of Hope mentions Shaitan. Which, which and... that first read-through of The Eye of the World and honestly the first couple of books drive that home as not just not just superstitious dangerous, but like legitimately dangerous yeah and, and that's um that's again it's in the same conversation that rand has with matt about the dark rider mm -hmm. um and that it could be the dark one and uh one of the congers or one of the coplins doesn't believe in the dark one and even named him and this was right before his crops all went to shit uh and he came down with uh some ailment or whatnot mm -hmm. Um, what? And then I think Nynaeve stumbles upon them and, and switches them for even suggesting something about it. So Yeah, what I meant to, but, to point out what, by saying that is that um, I think it's important to the story to recognize that this is a world where, if you want to call it sort of the, the world theology, right, the world religion about the, the Dark One and, and the Creator, the Light, all that stuff, is not... Uh, it's it's the opposite of a, a superstition or lore or you know whatever. It is very much universally recognized as real, right? So we see that being important with people the way that they treat oaths. Um, mm -hmm. We see that with the naming of the dark one, and it's relevant to you know hey we're the we're the white cloaks. It's relevant to the formation and existence of an organization like the white cloaks. Um, that this is not something that people doubt the existence of. So dark friends are not people who are heretics against a religion. They are they are people who who also acknowledge the uh, the the yeah. sort of binary nature of the good and evil forces that are very real. And and, and this manifests in the, in the world in a couple of ways too. Um, that's somewhat unexpected, but with everyone kind of buying into this religion as given, right? Yes. That, that there, there is a creator, there is a dark one. Mm -hmm. um, there are forces of good and evil, but at the same time, you don't have a church because you don't, like there's no uh, institution like that where the villagers go to to, uh, to pray or worship or whatnot because there's no dispute about it. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, it is so, a good point that the... that uh, a, yeah. a bit of a, a side <laughs> point from, from this said discussion because I think we're just talking about okay what what can you pick up and obviously yes. that last little insight is is from 
multiple reads on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but what else do you get out of this? Um, I I picked up at least that the Great Lord of the Dark can uh, can grant immortality or give people who have died and give them back to you, because that that's one thing that uh, keeps coming up at least in the Eye of the World in the dream sequences. Um, and at the finale with Carrie Al Thor is the, the temptation to kind of bring someone back or, or grant that. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's the, the greatest, well, not the greatest, it's, there's a great paragraph about setting the stakes about every turning of the wheel is always a, a fight between the shadow and the light. Mm -hmm. And that time goes on forever until it ends. Um, you're, as a wheel of time, picker upper of the books this is what you're gonna zone in on because you you see a reference to a wheel and the cyclical nature of time so you're gonna hone in on that um and most crucially is this is where the counterstroke right we we don't know much context about this this earlier conflict yeah. but we know that uh lewis theron did something to save everyone but there was a backlash or a counterstroke mm -hmm. and that's what's driven him insane and that's what's led him to kill his whole family. And even then, when he gets healed of this uh, of this affliction, of this madness, it the realization of what he's done, even though he wasn't really to blame for it, uh, it drives him to basically commit suicide in the most epic fashion. Yes. And lastly, what I what I can say is, um, at least my copy that I had had a picture or had a map. And I do understand that the very first editions, I think, of the Eye of the World did not have a map in them. Uh, so mine, mine but... does. Yeah, so I have, okay. I, have a, I have a first edition one as well, and it doesn't have a map on the, like, interior book binding, right? That's, a, that's the Emmons, okay. Emmons Field and the, the writers and stuff like that. But the, the very page after the, uh, you know, the, the lines from The Breaking of the World and The Cycle of the Dragon is a, a two-page map. Uh, of of the world, and then you go into chapter one. So you get a two page map of the world. Yeah. You get a one page map of the two rivers, and then chapter. One. Now, side side question, because I know my edition's not because uh, I got the thirtieth anniversary. I have the black and white map that's on the in interior pages as well, but it's the one that kind of looks fairly detailed and topographical. Yeah, and I know there's a version of maps that is not that way. Um, that. I think it was on the inside covers of uh, yes either book three or book four. Yeah, so I'm the, wondering if the black if and white provided. the black and white um, sort of topographical detailed one, the one that's in that's in the books. I think okay. the the colored one that you uh, that you get, I think that starts showing up as the the book bind later later books. Well, anyways, all all I did is I went looking for a big ass mountain and I found <laughs> Dragon Mount, so. That, that's at least what I did. So I was like, okay, that's where he blew himself up. Cool. And and I should note, so uh, my wife recently just started reading The Eye of the World. Um, and she actually, when she looked at the map, she, you know, passed the book over to me and said, where, where is Dragon Mount? Where is, where is, uh, where is all of this? But she actually had the same impulse as you did, just less patience. She was like, just tell me where it is. <laughs> you know where it is. you're not going to make me read through all these countries are you yeah okay oh i love it. i like your wife already okay all right so, so I, I guess the before meat we move of on, the yeah, discussion yeah. so no no more save save things i think you mentioned it the uh the name the name kinslayer uh and the fact that he, he yep. killed his whole family all that other stuff i think we mentioned that. so okay yeah what's let's let's move on to you know why why you keep coming back and keep rereading, right? I mean, any of us who are fans of this series, all of us, it seems like uh, we we do rereads of this series in a way that I I haven't encountered in readers of really any other series. Um, you know, like I I can say I've I've read all the books of the Lord of the Rings to include the Cimmerillion. Uh, I've never reread that series. Uh, this is the only series that I think that I've reread multiple times outside of. Uh, I was a really little kid. You know, kids rewatch movies a million times, reread books and stuff like that. So, so what is it? What's uh, what do you get on those rereads? So, first and foremost, I, and I can do these in kind of the order that you um, encounter them in the prologue, not necessarily the order in which the the shoe drops with okay. you as a reader. Yeah. Um, but the first one that you get. So, 
remember what the first three books, uh, what the big mystery is, is who the fuck is Baal Zaman? Yeah. Right? Is he the Dark One? Did did Rand kill the Dark One at the end? He certainly thinks uh, that he, he did. <laughs> he, he, and, and he goes so far as to name the Dark One uh, in Faldara. Yes. But then he has to he has to fight him again at Falme, and then he fights him for a third time. And after the third time, he kind of leaves a, a corpse or a husk uh, of a, an actual man. Mm-hmm. And that's the first time that you actually have characters um, kind of theorizing maybe Balzaman was Ishmael. Mm-hmm. Because, and, and Egwene uh, clues into this because Varen gave her that riddle wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in a name. Mm-hmm. Um, kind kind of tidbit of history for some reason when she was given her the the Dreamwalker to her angry elf, the Sleepweaver. And it's not just um, something that the audience is trying to to figure out either, because we get with the uh, we get with the story of the fallen Menethrin, we get the name Balsam, uh as as the the name Heart for of the Dark, Dark One then... in the Trolloc Tongue, I think is is how yeah. it's sort of introduced. So it is a broadly held belief. That the character that we ultimately find out is Ishamael was the Dark One. So it's actually, you know, we talked about the, the world religion being just pretty much accepted as fact, but clearly there's still there's still some misinformation and misunderstanding out there. Right, and, and this is what again on your first read, and you're not used to uh, the unreliable narrator that Robert Jordan uses. Um, but when there are only three books out or only two books out like this, this was probably a debate issue. And for me, trying to read spoilers or whatnot, um, once I had read through all the existing books at the time, um, there are discussions about, well, was Ishmael ever really bound? And I, okay, so I I had read through the whole series, so I knew that Balsamon was Ishmael because the books kind of established that by book four quite clearly. Um, But there was this kind of question, like, was he ever truly bound? And then evidence point number one, is well, he shows up in the prologue. So if he was bound in Shale Ghoul with the other Forsaken, how the heck is he there talking to Lewis Theron, who's insane? And that's that when the shoe drops, and I'm like, how did I not clue into that? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good point. That we we know that he wasn't at least fully bound. And I know there's the conversation about sort of the well, maybe he was cyclically bound. He had times where and he that, could be free, that sort of thing. That's um, what the Wheel of Time companion actually establishes. Yes. So it kind of go, that he gets spun out and largely uh, in thousand year intervals. And that's why kind of major events in the world, mm-hmm. uh, like the Trolloc Wars and then the War of the Hundred Years. And then finally, our, our Rand story kind of happened at that uh, thousand year interval. But neither here nor there. Um, when, when I basically got on the forums and was reading, yeah, no, the, obviously he was never fully bound because he shows up in the prologue. And then I went, I need to reread this prologue because <laughs> I did not make that connection. What else is there? All right. The the second thing that you'll pick up on a reread um, has to do with kind of that the Age of Legends world building. And again, if you've read through um, uh, The Shadow Rising and you had the Aiel history chapters, there you, you, you basically get more out of the prologue because you're back in the Age of Legends. Um, but the references to the Tamerlan and the Amerlin, yeah, obviously related words. One was a um, uh, a ruler when the Aes Sedai were both men and women. Again, that um, that symbol that uh, Louis Theron has on his cloak, uh, the symbol, the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai, the dragon fang and the uh, the the flame of Tarvalon. Yeah, those things kind of clue together. And then the nine rods of dominion. And you begin to kind of think, all right, is that an oath rod? Like, did he summon nine different kinds of rods? Maybe one of them was an oath rod or a binder. Um, was the the bale fire Turangreal, was that one of those rods? Notes apparently say that the nine rods of dominion were a political position. Mm-hmm. But I could kind of see, and, and Robert Jordan never really fills this in, that um, if a rod of dominion was a political position and answerable to the Tamerlan, those were probably like a governor type that held the executive power able to maybe administer oaths on a binder, which is what those rods were, right? So that the item kind of becomes the name for the, uh, the yeah. political position. So they're... And now I'm just theorizing, but... Yeah. Nine, I never nine really... rods of dominion is kind of thrown in here and never really mentioned again, but I always really liked it. 
Yeah, so I, I never really thought too hard about the Nine Rods of Dominion, mainly because it's not, not really ever brought back up again in, in the series. Um, I, I think the origin of the, the rods as Terangrial or, or sort of both rods or whatever, I think the origin of that was in the, the sort of the big white book um, where that's yep. what, that was, that's what was written there. Um, but and I mean, then notes there, from there, Robert There are Jordan. fun things about it. Yeah, yeah. The, and so we know that the the oath rod that the I said I have has a numeral on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we know that there's more than one oath rod because uh, <laughs> I was going to ask, the, do you remember the numeral that's on it? I think it's three, but it's okay. uh, it's not really noted in uh, like it's not a numeral that anybody really recognizes. I think. Yeah, for, I'll, I'll have to double check. For, but but uh, the the Aiel are given an oath rod, and they use it to bind Galena Caspin, right? Yeah, and so I was, we know that I was there's trying to think one. of the numbers on the oath rods, and I wanted to say, I thought one of them was a fairly high number. Like uh, the number in my head was like eleven or something like that. Um, that that could just be you know recalling your head cannon. Yeah, <laughs> miss. We'll say miss recollection if that's the case. And people can <laughs> people can comment on this video and tell me what the numbers are. Um, but anyway, okay. So you have you have the uh, the rods of dominion, which are interesting. The ring of Tamerlan, I think, is is a big one that that does actually fill in some world building, like you said. The ring of, ring of Tamerlan, the ancient symbol, of the Aes Sedai, that kind of stuff. Um, the hall of servants. The hall of servants. Yeah. Yeah. So by by reading through the glossary and finding out kind of what Aes Sedai means mm -hmm. and that they're servants of all. Okay, the hall of servants. Okay, that's the. The Aes Sedai meeting place, and again, th this that's a location that shows up quite a bit in the um, in the Aiel visions that Rand has, going back to the Age of Legends. So we know it's a, it's a place. So it's a good you you gloss over it when you first read it, and you don't know what it means. But it's he's he's already obviously plotted certain things out uh, in the story, and he knows that he's going to have to um, or he's going to bring the reader back to this place. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, I I always really kind of like that and being able to make those connections that's so, a minor one so talking about the glossary the i just had sort of a, a kind of fun oh, note yeah. so in the glossary the white tower is described as the palace of the amerlin seat in carvalon <laughs> which which i think is is funny because i don't think anyone who's read the full series would have would would refer to it as that right they'd think that it's <laughs> you know the home of you know all of the Aes Sedai or something like that. It's not the palace of the Amarlin seat. In fact, we know that Elida later wants to make a palace for the Amarlin seat. Um, it's and, even taller. And it just makes me laugh because, and we'll talk through this later, I'm sure. But um, clearly, in in the story that is important to the eye of the world, uh, the White Tower is actually so low on Robert Jordan's sort of world building priority list that it's not even like fully formed and defined in his head as he's writing the book and writing the glossary and yet we get you know a quarter of the story of the uh the wheel of crime set there well i i also <laughs> anyway. he, he goes into a lot of description about uh almost everything else but i still don't know based on the descriptions whether or not the white tower is a square tower or a circular tower High probability that it doesn't look nearly as phallic as it looks in the show, though. I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> we do. All right. So the next one is a big one. Okay. And this is where Elon Morin says, uh, I was never ever skilled at healing, mm -hmm. and I follow a different power now. Yes. Well, we know what that is once we've read, well, we get our first hint of what that different power is um in the shadow rising mm -hmm. but it's really only when you start getting forsaken points of view and especially moradin yeah that you kind of clue in that there's this true power um, now there should have been some hints i think okay because he he never well in within the prologue itself because lewis there never mentions uh being well it's not from his point of view so we got to remember that but yes. there's uh, no mentioning of him being able to sense the use of Sidene by this uh, betrayer of hope person. Mm -hmm. I think the um, the traveling mechanic is a little bit different. Yeah, you would, um, you certainly wouldn't recognize that until the, the rereads. Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, I think yeah, the, but first, again, the first instance of traveling that we see that is, that is defined as traveling would be Rand's use of skimming uh, in The Shadow Rising. And then traveling would have been... Avienda. Um, yes, which is Fires of Heaven, right? Would have been the first Probably. time that we see, you know, a gateway. And this was definitely not a gateway. Yeah. Um, let me see here. The air rippled, shimmered, solidified into a man who looked around, his mouth twisted briefly with distaste. So he's already describing how uh, Ishma uh, Ishmael's traveling. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and kind of using something different, but Lewis Theron doesn't sense the use of that power. And then kind of clearly here, uh, a page and a half later, where he says, "I follow a different power now." Um, be healed, and you know the shadow darkens on him. Everything about it looks kind of sinister. Um, but as a reader, when I'm going through this the first time, uh, and I have this uh, this Moradin character or the the Watcher. Not the Watcher, the the Wanderer in uh, in Shatter Logoth, and the streams of Balefire cross in a Crown of Swords. Right, that's kind of the the first real instance where Rand kind of clues in that there's something off about that guy because he didn't sense um, yeah. the Wanderer channel, mm -hmm. and they they cross streams so to speak, like they're Ghostbusters. Um, <laughs> yeah, but then. Then you go online and you're like, all right, who was this guy? What is he doing? And then the online community is saying, well, that's Morden, that's Ishmael. He uses the true power almost exclusively. He has saw flecks that float over his eyes. Uh, that manifest, it drove him insane. Yep. It partly explains why he got the, the burning eye look as Balsamon. And I'm like, how the hell do you guys know all this kind of stuff? Um, when the heck was all this true power stuff introduced? And again, like it was with uh, the question about Balsamon never being bound, they say, well, it was in the pro prologue. And I went, get the, sh shut the front door, um, <laughs> went back and reread it. And I'm like, holy crap, right here on literally the third page of the series, he's already setting up the true power. And which I thought was, which was mind boggling. And it's something that's, that's tied in in the, the end of the Eye of the World as well which is, is one more piece that the Eye of the World is actually a fairly self-contained story. Uh, there's there's yep. sort of the theory that Robert Jordan wrote it so that if the publishers didn't pick up, you know, books two and on, that, uh, you know, it would, it would be sort of a complete story. But anyway, the, you know, the fight between Rand and uh, Balsamon in sort of the epic sort of finale of the Eye of the World, um, you know, you see Balsamon with, the the sort of like black kind of cable that Rand goes and tries to cut, um, and so that is it's no it's noted as different from his his sort of you know source right, um, and it's also noted as as clearly not being originated within Balsamon. So yeah. another another clue within the eye of the world that uh, Balsamon is not the dark. Um, so you, so you see the the character of Balsamon and Ishamael and his connection with the Dark One poorly defined, but it's there at both the start and the end of the Eye of the World for any reader that goes back through on a reread. Like, wow, this actually this makes a lot of sense what I'm what I'm seeing happen. It's a good point. Um just the the next point, it happens in the same paragraph. Um, okay. but madness can be healed. So, and, and th this is kind of a, a, a Brandon Sanderson edition, or mm -hmm. at least that's the first time that a character other than Ishamil heals madness. Um, but you have the, uh, the Ashaman in Tyr who thinks he sees Murdral around every corner. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget his name, but, but Nynaeve heals him of the madness after she gets her, her skills increased by uh, unweaving compulsion, and then she gives it a try with this guy. Um, but throughout most of the series, you basically keep uh, getting that false narrator um, discussing, you know, why why couldn't the Aes Sedai fix anything uh, during the breaking of the world? And it was the the madness couldn't be healed, um, except and it, as things go relative to the true power, this is an insight that's maybe a little bit small. And I don't know how true this is, because in the same sense, um, Elon Morin says that a sister could give them or give him a few minutes 
mm-hmm. um, of, of uh, yeah, it could only give you a few lucid minutes. So it's not really implied how, how long is this healing of Lewis Theron going to actually last for. Um, yeah, but so, at least it's kind of, it's kind of given there that um, there so was some type of treatment. That what you, is that what you is your do. take on this, right? So, so I think there's two ways to interpret this. One would be it's another example of Nynaeve doing something better in terms of healing than even would have been possible in the Age of Legends, right? Which mm-hmm. which is cool. I mean, I think it it adds a lot to her character and her her talents and ability, and it and it matches with who she is as a character. Um, the other way to interpret it would be that in the absence of the cleansing of the source, you can't heal the madness because right. it'll it'll come right back, right? So it, so you can you can treat the symptoms for a while, but you can't actually cure the madness. But then in in the books themselves as the series progresses, we get the cleansing and then the cleansing opens the door for healing the madness, which is kind of yeah, the way it, that it, I've always interpreted it. So, so my sense here from from reading um, what Elon Morin says is that the sisters could maybe give an insane person a couple of lucid minutes, but it wouldn't be that you know all the taint got healed from their mind and then they went off and channeled and got retainted. Mm-hmm. It's more that they weren't able to fix the issue; they were only going to give them a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, and it's it's completely ambiguous as to what Elon Morin uh, or Ishmael actually achieves with Lewis there. In this paragraph, because he goes off and kills himself within the next five minutes, so I guess we'll never know. Um, but it's not that critical to the story. I just thought um, this is a fun thing, kind of like oh, madness was apparently not able to be healed, and the whole story goes on saying that. But it's again something that goes the complete opposite way back in the prologue. All the right. next point is this was a recent find of mine. Um, Balefire is actually hinted at. Yeah. in the prologue of the Eye of the World, and and specifically and, the role that Balefire plays in in the series. <laughs> yes, um, and, and possibly that um, the Dark One was recycling agents back in the Age of Legends, and that uh, Lewis Theron was aware of it. So yeah, let let me let me kind of make my argument here. Um, I'm just trying to find the actual da, 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 da. Uh, I'm trying to find the actual line here well, maybe you need to discuss some filler because it's am I on the wrong page so where I'm looking so he's been healed and then it says oh, here we go betrayer of hope you know 10 years betrayer of hope he goes into his thing right and then after, for what yeah, else so you have done, there can be no forgiveness. There can be no forgiveness, betrayer, but for Ilyena's death, I will destroy you beyond anything your master can repair. Prepare to long dash. Remember, you fool. So what he's implying there with uh, I will destroy you beyond anything your master can repair, he is going to bail fire Ishamiel right there. Mm-hmm. Burn him out of time so that the, the Dark One can't get him back. But this implies that Louis Theron has knowledge that the the dark one can repair someone who's been killed by a different way. Yep. Um, but again, goes to sh- he doesn't really reveal what Balefire is in the series, Robert Jordan, until book five, and what the mechanics are. But right here on the fourth page uh, of of the books of the, everything in its entirety, he's laid the groundwork, or he's he's obviously thought about this and he has this kind of cool mechanic he knows what he's playing with and he drops a nice little hint Mm -hmm. that this is coming um but yes this this was a more recent find of mine uh kind of an allusion to balefire and as well um because darth rand in the uh in the gathering storm he kind of clues in and maybe it's a lewis there in memory that since the forsaken are getting recycled balefire is the only way to deal with them and that's kind of what he uses as justification to go after natron's barrow yeah um i think i think by that point he's he's been using it against you know dark hounds and the forsaken and things like that for a while uh yep. but it, i think definitely yeah we we see him pretty much explain why it's justified even in the even in the case of that where you know he i think that was the first time we sort of see a bail scream right yep. um anyway 
Uh, okay. Anyway, I I just like because it's not like Balefire was created out of whole cloth in the third book. Um, yeah. Which, which certain like people can get accused of basically um, rebooting or re-upping the stakes or or adding new things into their series later. I always just really liked the real time precise because um, there's so much foreshadowing and forethought that goes in, and the clues are all in the first book, right? The Chodan call um, is mentioned in the first book, or at least the one on Tremolkin. Um, the Tower of Genji, which is the setting for the, the big finale of the 13th book, mm-hmm. that's in um, that's in the first book. Like, there are so many things. that There's a clue as to how the taint on the dark uh, on Sidene gets cleansed, and it's how Pat and Fane makes it through the ways. Like, there, there are things that are just dug in and buried in this original story um that are so good and you just you need to sit back and appreciate that he thought about his story um start to finish before he even put pen to paper well i might disagree with you a little bit about the patent thing and the ways being a hint for that i think that's probably the subject of another another discussion so um i no man it's the, the taint gets cleansed because it's the annihilation of one evil versus the other. So, uh, how, so why did Matcham Shin, the, Matcham Shin left uh, Pat and Fane alone because he was infected with uh, Mordeth and Mashadar? So the the difference is, I think that Mashin Shin is not uh, is not as directly connected with the Dark One as as might be required for that logic to work. Ma- Matcham Shin is a manifestation of the taint on Sidene because it was the ways that were grown with Sidene. So it is the taint and again this is this is again we're gonna go far afield here. I'll summarize and just say my interpretation is that Mashin Shin is caused by the taint, similar to the madness being caused by the taint, but it is its own thing. And I think that it it recognizes mm. an evil that is sort of like to like. That's why it leaves him alone. But it it kills Shadow Spawn and things and you know people who are connected yeah. with the Dark One. So it's it's not anyway. That, like I said, another conversation probably. We're focusing on the on the prologue here. This is all right. This is what happens anytime people discuss the Wheel of Time. There's there's too much. <laughs> and we've been drinking, or at least I have. Um, you have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now we've also got uh, traveling that, yeah. that is mentioned in the prologue, and that that is again it's a power that doesn't really show up uh, until the fourth book, although it's a skimming yep. then, um, and traveling becomes very very so, critical. The so rest I of would the series. I would disagree. I think that traveling traveling shows up in in the eye of the world. Um, um, but again, that's one of those things where you don't understand what you're reading. You don't you understand read what it. you're reading when you're first reading. That's true, and I think that it's because Rand doesn't understand it while it's happening. So again, the yeah, shift and it's from, and it's from his point first of person, view. right? Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, I but think you do that have a cap- you have a capitalized travel. You do in, yeah. in the prologues, so you understand that this is a power and it's something possible. Mm-hmm. And it's mentioned later um, as kind of a, a lost ability a lost of the art. Aes Sedai. So, yeah. Um, but that you kind of you pick up on, and and you know what, uh, you'll pick up on the fact that Lewis Theron went somewhere else to make the volcano, and he used magic to get there. Yes. Um, that that you'll pick up kind of right away. That it's called traveling and mm-hmm. everything. That you might miss on a casual read going through. Um, and then lastly, the thing that you pick up. Um, and again, you might you might glean this from the from the map, um, but that the island that Ishamael, or the black clad figure, stands on when he's you know shaking his fists at the heavens, saying, "Oh, you can't get away from me that easily. Uh, I'll see you again sometime." That's actually Tarvalon before the city is built there. That, but that's yes. something that you, that's something you clue into either by um, the quality of, of your overall map that you look at because it's. Not really clear that Tarvalon is an island uh, until you get, I think, a city map of it in book three. Mm-hmm. I want to say, um, but that kind of becomes clear on a on a subsequent read. Oh, not only did Dragon Mount get created, but the creation of Dragon Mount also led to the creation of the island that becomes Tarvalon. And and you get the uh, you know not necessarily full sort of implications of this, but you do get you know the first inhabitant of that island as well (laughs) 
He never goes away. That's for <laughs> darn sure. Keeps coming back. Exactly. Um, so yeah, the uh, it's I don't know. I think it's sort of an interesting thing there. It doesn't really get utilized much, other than what we later learn about the tower being about the most infested sort of hive of uh, <laughs> wretched scum hive of villain. scum and villainy. <laughs> but the most infested population of dark friends, really anywhere in the entire series outside of Blight, um, yeah. is Tarvalon and and Ishamael is the first person to set foot on after its formation. Um, okay, so what, uh, what, what do you think we haven't hit yet that you want to call out? Um, as far as any, any pickups I, I, or things that you pick up on the read, I think we hit all the main ones. Uh, other people in the comments, if there are uh, other insights um, that you've picked up, um, please write down and let us know and uh, maybe give you a shout out in a, in a subsequent vid. Um, but I, I think where we steer the discussion now is um, by excluding this prologue from any type of adaptation, Yeah. what are you doing? Because you are shooting yourself in the foot in a number <laughs> of ways. Yes. Um, so I think, I think we've, we've laid out a good argument for the, the role that the prologue played in, in the eye of the world and in the series as a whole, right? It really... It gives you a foundation of a lot of the lore. It gives you so much world building in such a small package, and it really sets the stakes, right? Like it, yes. it, it sets well, that... the the sort of the struggle between good and evil. The fact that there are are true powerful, you know, agents on both sides. It sets the circ the cyclical nature of the the wheel of time sort of world. Uh, it builds all of that in five pages right um so here are my notes and you've hit on more than half of them but you don't <laughs> get an antagonist by excluding the prologue so you okay you introduce yeah. a protagonist but yes. also the antagonist yes your protagonist turns into a volcano but your antagonist is implied he's still going to be there and, and around and i he like is that the, take the that actually so that that basically uh that starts out that not only is the world that we're seeing one that has a protagonist and an antagonist, but one where the power of good is is sort of uh, you know on a on a decline, right? So the the agent of the enemy is still there, you know, still on the field of yep. battle. So you get a, and this is tied to the protagonist, but you get a savior figure that's also feared. Because you kind of get that conflicting mm -hmm. thing between the the history yeah. uh, excerpt and then the prologue itself, and mm -hmm. then quite quite qu quickly after that, where you have uh, Rand and Matt discussing that the Dark Rider could be the dragon and that the dragon is feared, you get that, and I think that's a hallmark of of the Wheel of Time as well. And Rand has to deal with that throughout the entire series, right? Um, he is kind of a savior figure, but everybody's terrified of him. You know, and that, you don't know how people are going to react when when pe when they're afraid. So that point is um, so well made when you consider what we actually got in the the Wheel of Prime, right? The the reactions of the characters to being told that one of them might be the dragon makes I don't have zero any feathers, sense. But, yeah. <laughs> makes zero sense when you think of you know what the readers of the book would have thought, right? Like the the stakes of who the dragon is. Uh, are not established because, like you, like yeah. you said, there's but, it, there's no establishing sort of a uh, story. But th this is a key differentiator of the Wheel of Time as a series, right? When when you're introducing, okay, your main character is going to be a savior figure, um, but it's a feared savior figure, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't um, this isn't something that people look forward to. If anything, they are dreading the coming of their savior. Um, and they might actually behave irrationally uh, as a result of it. But so that's actually anyway. You, it, you exclude the the prologue, and, and you're not going to get any of that. So what do you think about the idea that? Uh, so one of the criticisms of the Wheel of Time, and and sort of the the savior story, is that it is it's so over it's so overplayed out. This idea of you know sort of the. Uh, the the societal savior and they're like oh it's a rip off of dune it's a rip off of this you know the people think that it's very sort of a you know a very played out as a motif right and yet i can't think and i think you you've probably read a lot more fantasy than i have i've read fairly extensively but i don't think as much as you um 
the idea of the apocalyptic threat of the savior, right? The, the idea that at best, the dragon is looked at as being in the frying pan instead of in the fire, right? Is yeah, there another what... story where you think that that is explored to the level that it's explored in the real world? Um, probably not, although I think with Dune, um, the savior figures in, in that mythos isn't necessarily uh, all that good either. Mm -hmm. um, and, and But his people don't too, view him as, as bad, yeah, right? He views himself you, as bad. That's true. And, and I guess you could also say that there is a, an element of Christianity involved in, uh, in the Wheel of Time too, right? A, a second coming of Jesus. There are people who not, don't look forward to that either, right? Because it means judgment day is, is, is upon us and it is, you know, eschatological or, or end of the world type stuff. But it, it's not in the same vein as Wheel of Time that looks as time is cyclical. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, as far as fantasy goes, if you think that, you know, a giant savior... Um, story is a trope and overdone you're reading the wrong genre i mean like <laughs> if you don't like these types of stories and go no, that, i think that's go, it go that's read a, something up. yeah raginor should have made a different story <laughs> yeah, exactly uh and then a couple other things but you you hit on these you, you don't get the stakes so you don't get the um just the the sense of what the madness can do um how powerful these these uh these eyes to die or these male eyes to die actually were uh, in that they can, you know, rip the world apart and uh, create volcanoes in a fit of rage. You don't get the magic system, um, although the bifurcation between sight in and sight R are not really mentioned in the prologue itself. It is kind of one of the first things that gets established in Moraine's discussions with Egwene. Yeah, is the bifurcated nature of the power, and that only the male side is tainted, uh, and that's why it's not safe to use. And you can pity those that are forced to channel because. They don't want to do these evil things. Uh, they're driven insane. I would actually say I do it, think it's a, it's set up in in the eye of the world or the the prologue. It may be put into the category of one of those those reread sort of insights. But we get the idea that that you so you know Elon Moran oh, yeah, yeah. telling him that he's gone mad and the you know some of your sisters might be able to sort of heal you right. So there there is the idea that the madness is affecting Luz, uh, but it's not affecting at least his sisters, right? It doesn't say some of yeah. your fellow Aes Sedai. It, it says sisters. So I think that the yeah. elements are there, but you're probably not on that first read. So, so it is It is consistent with the world, but it's just not It's not um, explained yet, right? It, it's yeah. built up a little bit later. Um, and then the, the other thing you don't, uh, if, by excluding the prologue, is you don't get that great line of Ishmael about the fight happening over and over and over. Uh, and will happen until time ends and the <laughs> the shadow is triumphant. So and then you have to for work a lot of, that line a lot of people somewhere were... into uh, you know a certain Tumblr barmaid oh. has to uh, oh. has to bring oh. that line up. <laughs> Are we going to end on this point? Because I got nothing more to say, and now I'm depressed, and I need my, I need more to drink. Uh, sorry, I couldn't couldn't resist as you're bringing that line up. Uh. <laughs> uh. This is a good chat. Shitty way to end it, but it is what it is. <laughs> I think I think that there's probably a little bit more that we can that we can bring up here. So oh. so <laughs> positive positive things that you can bring up. Um, so I think if we're still trying to talk about you know things that you miss from a storytelling perspective, right? Um, I think that you miss not just the stakes of sort of the the existential stakes. Um, but I think you actually miss the idea that like that man actually plays a role in the like in this conflict, right? So so the idea that like the dragon went and did his the strike on Shea Ogul, which isn't specifically, you know, really fleshed out, but you get you get the idea of the attack, the ceiling, the counterstroke, right? So the idea that that men, uh, and I say men as in humans, right, um, are actually significant enough agents that that they that they can actually wage this fight, I think is huge. They're not, they're to not the story. just at the whim of cosmic forces. Yes, yes, um, because I think that you know outside of the prologue here, the rest of the book, like you actually 
get a sort of you get a sort of societal level view that people actually are just at the whim of cosmic forces to use your line i think it's apt because you get all of this you know the the wheel will or weaves as the wheel wills right um and people are sort of uh sort of passive in their in their lives um from that perspective but we know as the reader having seen the prologue and some of the stuff that's fleshed out about the prologue that like actually that's not really true that that humans actually have agency which is i mean that's the veins of gold sort of revelation in, in the end of the books right is is the idea that sure we're all spun out we live these lives but elon morin's insight was actually incorrect is that we're not just living in this world we actually shape the now, now you're opening up a can of worms because it's going to lead into a Taviran discussion that I, I don't really want to have, but it, it's uh, fair, fair. <laughs> we already, we already had that. Um, you know, it, it's an open question as to whether or not, um, you know, your main protagonist, the, the Taviran, if they do have the agency in which you say, but I, I think, um, maybe we can leave it off by spoiling the end of this whole series. Um, but it, it, two of the most telling lines kind of at the very end are that Rand realizes it was never about him. Mm -hmm. And and then, and then you begin to see, okay, why did Robert Jordan introduce all these fantastic characters? And there are so many that are, you know, taking part in the bat. It's not just about Rand. It was never just about Rand. This isn't just Rand's story. You don't do four and a half million words about one character. There are thousands of named characters. Um, and they all had a role to play, mm -hmm. which was great. Um, but also the whole existence of this, um, like why, why does the dark one even exist? Rand's delusion that he thinks he can kill the dark one. Yeah. And that's what his, his battle is. And then just, just the realization kind of at the end that, um, you need to have the choice because if you rob people of the choice to be good or to be evil, um, then they're just as dead inside as if there was only one option for them and it happened to be evil. So all of a sudden, the, the bimodal cosmic universe of a creator and a dark one, it mm -hmm. makes a heck of a lot of sense. Um, and it is a, a, you know, I wouldn't say it's a profound theological insight because others have had this kind of view uh, going back. Sure. I think it's the, the rebuttal to the, the Epicurean riddle, um, you know, or Better yet, it's Satan's line from the, the South Park movie. <laughs> uh, Without evil, there can be no good, so it must be good to be evil sometimes. Well, um, man, I don't, I don't think I have anything else to say on this other than uh, if you haven't done a reread in a while, while, you should. If you haven't watched The Wheel of Crime, you shouldn't. And... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but if I we guess... missed anything in this prologue, just let us know in the comments down below. Um, Please do. And uh, I'll, always happy to find new things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And Dane, just really appreciate the you taking the time here. It was really, really fun conversation as always. And for everyone else, uh, you know, comment, like, subscribe, all that, and uh, walk in the light.